Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be chatting with the Thrive program this morning about spine surgery for 2021. We're going to talk about some of the new technologies that are out there in spine surgery and uh, with a focus on how can the technology be more than just something that's new and innovative and cool, but also one that translates into better outcomes for patients, which is ultimately what it's all about, of course. Um, so disclosures, I do consult for Strikers and Biomed. I don't think anything in this talk will be relevant to those consultancies. And we'll talk about some of the new technologies and then how it correlates with patient outcomes. This is a great quote, I thought. Um, the riskiest thing we can do is just to maintain the status quo. And I think that's, um, I think that we sometimes get pigeonholed into the mentality that this is the way it's done. So this is the way we should carry it forward. But I think that uh, there's a lot of exciting new things that have come out in spine surgery. And I think you want to adopt them in a way that's, you know, having a vision, but also in, in, a, in a way that's safe for patients. So minimally invasive spine surgery is the fastest growing market segment in spine surgery. It's been very um, hot over the past few years. Um, and I think there's really three, four things that we'll talk about today. The first one is navigation. Navigation is being able to link a patient's scan to what you see in the operating room. So you can touch a probe to the patient and see where you are on that patient's anatomy, correlating it with their preoperative MRI or CAT scan, usually CAT scan, or, or blended both. Um, intraoperative imaging is basically an intraoperative CAT scan or intraoperative 3D reconstruction. And this is a way that you can confirm placement of instrumentation before leaving the operating room. So you can imagine if you have a screw that's malpositioned in a patient, it could be a little bit too angled medially or toward the spinal canal that can injure the spinal canal or the spinal cord. It could be angled a little bit too low uh, and that could be pushing on the nerve root. So you don't wanna ever leave the operating room without knowing that the screw that you placed is in the proper position, but this has always been a limitation and that we have fluoroscopy in the operating room, but that's not 100%. So nowadays with intraoperative CT scanner or similar to a CT scan device, we can avoid that complication of spine surgery. After that, I'll talk about virtual reality and augmented reality. This is a, an area that's near and dear to my heart and, and I have a lot of um, uh, interest in it and a lot of uh, ongoing research studies with it. And finally, robotics, which is a major, major change to spine surgery. And that two years ago or so, we started using robots in spine surgery. Um, at the stage where we are now, they're only used to place pedicle screws. But I think uh, over the next few years, it's obviously going to evolve for the better, be more streamlined, be more efficient, and be more uh, diverse in the applications. So we'll start with this. These are the three main devices in the market right now. Uh, this right here is called the O-arm. It looks like a, a donut and uh, it opens from here to here. So you can bring it in a C-shaped form over the patient and then you close the ring and you do an intraoperative CAT scan. Then you have this, which is the navigation aspect, which is what we touched on earlier, where you touch the probe to the patient and you know where you are in space on that patient's anatomy. This is called an aero CT, similar device, but this one does not open. This one has a special bed that comes along with it that's attached to it. And so if you wanna use it to navigate, this uh, donut uh, rotates down, not rotates, it uh, migrates down on the patient to the area of interest as a, a CAT scan that moves back out of the way on its own. And the last one is called the Zeme. And there's a few other devices out there right now that are similar, but this is these are the three that are really, uh, I would say, cornering the market right now. This is a similar device, but it does a 3, 3D uh, fluoroscopy spin, takes many, many cuts in different, uh, as it moves around the patient. So you get like a, essentially a CAT scan, but a little bit less, less good quality than a CAT scan. Why is this important? Um, because we have this study that looked at 9,310 screws and it showed that with 3D navigation, the screws uh, are 96% accurate as opposed to 68% accurate fluoroscopy. So that's a major difference, obviously, especially uh, if you could do this on, you know, this is 1,973 patients, but of course it's, a, it's the amount of patients we need to do this on to not have the complication that we would have had if we were just using fluoroscopy. And I would argue at least 
that, in my opinion, that the number is relatively small of the amount of patients you need to treat in order to have a, to catch a screw that's malpositioned. Um, the minimally invasive TLIF is, uh, is uh, a procedure that we do that um, accomplishes a lot of what we do in open surgery, but we do it through a minimally invasive approach. So instead of doing a big midline incision, um, we do percutaneous placement of the screws, percutaneous placement of an interbody cage, and we do the decompression. So basically, instead of doing a more aggressive surgery where the, hospitals, where, where the hospital stay is often three nights, four nights, uh, we do it with a surgery where the patient goes home the next morning. Um, how can we do this? There's a lot of things that have been evolving, even in my own practice over the course of the past few years. Um, but the biggest thing I would say that helps us accomplish the goals of open surgery with a minimal invasive approach is some of this new device technology. So this is just a, a, a Google search of expandable t lift cage. Um, and uh, these are the cages that we insert after we remove the entirety of the disc of the patient. We substitute the disc with the cage. But if you put in a static cage, meaning a cage that just you, you put it inside and, and that's it, it's hard to get nice correction of the patient's anatomy. You wanna get the patient to have lordosis. So you want them to have a nice curvature in their spine. You want them to have a large foraminal height, which is the canal, the, the room for where the, can, where the canal that the nerve travels through, you wanna enlarge the space so that the nerve has more room. You wanna increase the disc height, which is the height of the disc that you removed. You want it to be tall. All of these can be challenging when you have a minimally invasive approach, but now that we have these expandable cages, you put them in in a collapsed state. It's easier to put it in. You don't have to circumvent the nerve that's in your way with as much difficulty. You put the cage in its collapsed state, and then once it's in, you can insert a device that jacks it open like a tire jack, um, and this gives a really nice correction in the disc height, the foraminal height, the segmental lordosis, all the things I mentioned a moment ago. So it's sometimes incorporating new technologies can help you accomplish the goals through more minimally invasive approaches. This is, a, it's called Cambin's triangle, and this is the triangle that we work through in order to remove the entire disc. But you can imagine this is a challenge when you have bone in your way and nerve in your way, and just a small little triangle to work with. But again, this goes back to using the technology, using the expandable cage, but also using navigation. So we can put an inst instrument into this triangle and know exactly where we are in space. So if we want to remove as much disc as possible, because the more disc you get out, the better the fusion rate, the better of a job you do. You angle this way, you angle this way, you angle this way. So you, know, you could do that with using navigation. Um, so incorporating all of the technologies can help you accomplish your goals. This is a patient who has L2, L3, L4. L2, L3 has a really nice, normal, healthy disc between it. L3, L4 has a totally collapsed disc, collapsed disc. Um, and the goal of the surgery here is to get into this collapsed disc space and restore the height, reduce the fact that this bone is slipped forward on this bone. It's not neatly stacked on top of it. It actually slipped forward. There's a name for that. It's called spondylolisthesis. So we have to get into that collapsed state and restore it, restore the disc height, restore the foraminal height, reduce the spondylolisthesis, and, and do it with a minimally invasive approach. And we were able to do so with a combination of this cage, which is an expandable cage, as well as the technology that allowed us to remove the entirety of the disc. And you see, it's a really dramatic difference from pre to post surgery. The, the, the bone is now less slipped forward on this bone. The height uh, is drastically improved. And, and again, we use technology to help us get there. These are studies showing that uh, some studies have shown that expandable t lifts dramatically change what we do as spine surgeons, and then some studies have shown no difference. So it remains to be seen, and I think we need to do more research to prove it. Augmented reality, um, as this audience knows, is a merging of the virtual world with the physical world. Um, this is a way that we can enhance our procedural and interoperative environment. So we're looking at the patient, we have a wearable item, and we can have whatever relevant anatomy we want projected onto a physical view of the patient. This will allow us to, let's say we're putting in a pedicle screw, we can see where the nerve traverses, we can see where the fecal sac, the sac that contains the nerves is, nerve, nerves are, and we can have that projected onto our view of the patient and help us put it in. So this is something I did with a company called Surgical Theater. I have no disclosures with them. 
where we built this realistic model of the patient. This is actually a patient's CAT scan that was reconstructed. We were able to play with it and the patient had a spinal deformity. So we were able to institute the curvature the patient had and fix it and see how, how we can fix it with different techniques. We can take an individual vertebrae, pull it out, rotate it in space. We can practice putting pedicle screws and rods in the patient. So um, I think this is like the first thing we can do. We're, look, we're doing a complex deformity spine surgery. There's a lot of rotation. It's hard to put in a screw. We want to see the entry point. We want to see the, the trajectory and we can do that with this technology. Virtual reality is when you have no visualization outside of what you're looking at um, inside your virtual reality model. This can be used for education and preparation for cases in a controlled setting where you can make a mistake and obviously it has no um, sequelae or, or issue with the actual patient outcome. This is an international interest. These are patients from Switzerland and Sweden and Italy. And, and it just shows that everyone's very excited and, and interested in this technology. The first FDA to clear, FDA clear device was Augmetics. That was in 2019. So it's only just been rolled out into spine surgery, but you see that you have this wearable um, device and you can see the spine through the patient's skin. And so you can be placing a, a pedicle screw, but you know exactly where you are in the patient's anatomy with this axial and sagittal reconstruction projected onto a viewer. You don't need to turn your head, your head away or have any diverted attention away from the patient. So this is very exciting and the applications are going to expand and improve over time. There's no question about it. This was the first virtual reality case at Mount Sinai Hospital. This was a patient of mine who had uh, worsening neck pain and left-sided weakness. You see here, they had a tumor in their C3 vertebrae, but more importantly, they had epidural tumor wrapping around their spinal cord. This is the spinal cord here in black. And this, all of this white is surrounding tumor, like basically circumferentially around the spinal cord that was causing him to have left-sided weakness. This is before the case we were looking and practicing with his anatomy. And this is an actual video of his anatomy. So all we had to do was get an MRI, get a CAT scan, fuse them together, incorporate into the surgical theater technology. And you see here, you can show this to the patient. I wrote aha here because you show this to the patient, they have this aha moment. They see that it's on their left side. They see where it is in their spine. They see the surrounding structures. They see why the surgery is risky and why the risks are what they are. We, we uh, gave this survey out to patients um, and we cataloged their uh, satisfaction with this virtual reality model and their education. So basically we can educate our trainees, we can counsel patients, we can enhance procedures, and this is only gonna improve over time. We do need research, innovation, and collaboration to make it happen. And I'll end the talk with robotics. Um, there are four robots right now. Um, this is called the Mazor, which is Medtronic. This is the Globus robot. These are the two I would say that are cornering the market right now. The Cirque is from Brain Lab and it's coming out. Uh, it's actually already out, but it's not fully developed yet. So they were we, we trialed it a few months ago um, and it was only used for drilling, but not putting in screws yet. So we're very early on in the Cirque. And then the Rosa robot is used uh, for in cranial applications. And it's an excellent, excellent robot, but it has uh, not quite come out with spine applications yet, but shortly they will be. And again, there's a lot of papers um, on this subject, uh, even in the short amount of time we've had robots for. Um, and um, it remains to be seen how much impact it has on patient outcomes, but it, it's, going to, it's going to be shown that it's helping and we just need to help get it to where it needs to be. Again, like everything else we discussed in three years, it'll be very different than today, five years, 10 years, certainly. Can it do a laminectomy for us? Can it do an interbody fusion for us? You know, can it be autonomous of us holding the devices, which we are still holding devices with the robots? So they're not true robots. Failure, success, and progress, as Albert Einstein said. So I do think that even if it's right now not where it needs to be, it will get there. The last one I'll end with is a company called 7D, which is a very exciting technology using flash registration. So you see here, this is a light handle, but it also has millions of cameras, not millions, many cameras inside but it takes thousands of fiducial points in space. So all you need to do is you take a picture with this light handle. It takes, I think around 20 to 30,000 fiducial points on the bone. 
and then you're, you're, you're up and running. So as long as you have a preoperative CAT scan, this, this obviates the need for an intraoperative CAT scan. So you can imagine if you just have a preoperative thin cut CAT scan uh, done with many, um, many cuts, many, many uh, it's called a um, three millimeter cuts, no gantry angle. So basically it, it's just a high definition CAT scan. You do that before the case, you bring the patient to the OR, you take this camera flash that takes two seconds and you're up and running. You can imagine that if this takes off, um, that it will be a dramatic change to the way we do things in the operating room. And actually I've been trying to get one at Mount Sinai for a little while, and it looks like we may get one, but there's no radiation, it's flash registration, and it obviates the need for an interoperative CAT scan. So this is exciting stuff. And this is the kind of technology that will be changing the way we do spine surgery in the future. With that, I would just end on saying the future of spine surgery is bright, and I want to thank everyone for their attention, and I think I'm happy uh, to take any questions now, if I am there with you now in real life. Have a good day. Bye.